On May 1st, 1776, five men gathered around a table in Ingolstadt, Bavaria. Leading them was a local professor of canon law, the 28-year-old Adam Weishaupt. They gathered to inaugurate a new secret society, the Order of Perfectibilists. Its name soon changed to the Order of the Illuminati, or in German, the Illuminaten Order. The Order of the Enlightened. Its totem was the Owl of Minerva, or Athena, the ancient goddess of wisdom. Another symbol was a dot in a circle representing the all-seeing eye. Not the all-seeing eye of God, but of the mysterious, unknown superiors to whom the order answered. The day, May 1st, marked an ancient fertility festival, and it was the extension of the preceding Walpurgis Night, long associated with witchcraft and evil spirits. Weishaupt's tiny order had grand ambition. Their aim was to make men free and happy. But first, they had to make them good. Weishaupt envisioned nothing less than a world revolution that would result in a universal republic, a new world order. This necessitated destruction of Christianity and all other forms of religion. It also meant the annihilation of all governments. The new order would bring liberation from all social, moral, and religious restraint and embrace absolute equality and social fraternity. Religious superstition would be replaced with atheism for the masses and a kind of enlightened pantheism for the higher classes. A communism of goods would govern economics. The benevolent enlightened elite, the Illuminati, would reign over this earthly paradise. As Weishaupt put it, the superiors of Illuminism are to be looked upon as the most perfect and the most enlightened of men. No doubts are to be entertained even of their infallibility. Down with the old masters. Say hello to the new masters. I bet that even if you've never taken notice of secret societies before, you've heard of the Illuminati. Well, over two centuries later, the term is embedded in popular culture as the generic name for a conspiratorial group bent on world domination. People pour over Super Bowl ads looking for hidden Illuminati symbols, and they're even parodied in Taco Bell commercials. The Bavarian Illuminati have spawned a cottage industry of conspiracy theory. In this lecture, we're going to explore the roots of Weishaupt's creation, what it believed, what it did, and its legacy. Perhaps, its survival. The Illuminati were very much a creature of the 18th century Enlightenment, a time that, while it's mostly identified with the flowering of reason and science, also saw an explosion of interest in mysticism and the occult. The century that produced the French philosophers Diderot, Rousseau, and Voltaire also gave us the Italian forger and swindler Alessandro Cagliostro, the German hypnotist Friedrich Anton Mesmer, and the ageless alchemist, the Count of Saint-Germain. There is nothing new about Weishaupt's utopian vision. The term Illuminati has been used many times before. In the classical age, any initiate of a mystery cult was considered an Illuminatus. The same was true for a Christian who'd undergone baptism. In essence, what Weishaupt envisioned was the realization of heaven on earth, the immanentizing of the Eschaton. That notion goes back a long, long time. A fifth century Persian prophet named Mazdak imagined something much the same. Another version is the millennial paradise that many believe Christ will usher in on his return, or the perfect kingdom Jews anticipate with the Messiah. The difference is that Weishaupt's perfect kingdom would be instituted by humans themselves, at least the illuminated ones. Weishaupt's original contribution to this ancient theme was organization, as opposed to open proselytizing, mass movements, and direct confrontation, he advocated secrecy, or more to the point, conspiracy. The great strength of our order lies in its concealment, he decreed, 
Let it never appear in any place in its own name, but always covered by another name and another occupation. Besides Weishaupt's lack of originality, there was the question of whether he was the real master of his conspiracy or the tool of something bigger. Occult and Masonic scholar Manley P. Hall claimed that the Bavarian Illuminati were but a fragment of a larger movement. Hall viewed Weishaupt as a faithful servant of a larger cause, and that behind him moved the intricate machinery of the secret schools. Hall warned that the mystery schools never trust their full weight to any perishable institutions. The Bavarian Illuminati were a chapter in a story, not the whole story. Outwardly, Weishaupt and his brethren came nowhere near to achieving their lofty ambitions. The Bavarian Illuminati officially lasted barely a decade. The group is easy to dismiss as another of history's countless failed pipe dreams. But it's not as simple as that. The Illuminati were never rounded up or brought to account. Weishaupt lived to write, plot, and influence until his death in 1830 at the ripe age of 82. Nor was the society's organization seriously disrupted. After all, it was invisible. Remember, Weishaupt decreed that the order's strength lay in concealment and that it would always appear under other names. How do you ban that? Like other secret societies in history, such as the Templars, Assassins, Cathars, and still more before them, there's every reason to suppose that the Illuminati carried on in one form or another. You could argue that being exposed was the best thing that ever happened to the Illuminati. There's no such thing as bad publicity. Exposure spread the name of the order far and wide. People who might never have heard of it now did. And as many were intrigued as repulsed. Some even argue that Weishaupt himself blew the order's cover for precisely that reason. In other words, it was part of his plan. So who was Adam Weishaupt? His full name was Johann Adam Josef Weishaupt. He was not Jewish, as some have claimed, nor was he a Jesuit priest or any kind of religious figure. He was the son of a lawyer who died young and left his son's upbringing in the hands of a godfather, Baron Johann von Ickstaff. And Ickstaff was the embodiment of an Enlightenment scholar as lay director of the Jesuit-run University of Ingolstadt. He possessed a large library of forbidden and esoteric books to which young Adam had early and ready access. Doubtless, he learned a few things. At age 15, Adam entered Ingolstadt University and followed his late father in the study of law. He graduated in 1768, age 20, and right away assumed a professorship at the same school. He was a hometown boy made good. He seemed a typical member of the German intellectual establishment. Weishaupt's Jesuit instructors were noted for the rigorousness of their education. A part of this was the notion of casuistry. It was the use of rational argument to back up dubious, deceptive, or self-serving conclusions, especially moral ones. Simply put, the art of propaganda. Weishaupt learned an important but often overlooked lesson. The voice of reason isn't the one telling you to show mercy. It's the one telling you not to leave any witnesses. The Jesuits were basically a secret society within the Catholic Church. Under the absolute authority of their superior general, they fought the enemies of the church by all means, fair and foul. Political conspiracy, even assassination, was their stock and trade. Much like the medieval Knights Templars, they amassed wealth and power. And like the Templars, this aroused envy and fear. In the Templars' case, it ended in accusations of heresy and blasphemy. The Jesuits nearly suffered the same fate. In 1773, Pope Clement XIV was persuaded 
to abolish the Jesuits. For Weishaupt, this meant opportunity. At Ingolstadt, he ascended to deacon of canon law. Weishaupt later expressed both disdain and admiration for his Jesuit mentors. His later position at the head of the Illuminati directly mimicked the autocratic power of the superior general. Arguably, the whole plan of the Illuminati, even its secretiveness, was taken straight from the Jesuit playbook. Thus, some suspected that Weishaupt remained a Jesuit at heart and secretly did their bidding. So what was Weishaupt's plan? First, he was obsessed with secrecy. He proclaimed that, of all the means I know to lead men, the most effectual is a concealed mystery. The hankering of the mind is irresistible. Noting that the games and abuses of secret societies were without end, he said, I wanted to make use of this human weakness for a real and worthy goal, the welfare of mankind. Simply put, Weishaupt saw that men desire status, and offering them access to secrets, real or imagined, was a way to manipulate them. He looked for an existing secret society to serve as a cover for his new one. Weishaupt decided that none is fitter than Freemasonry. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. He mocked ordinary Freemasonry as a frivolous business, but appreciated the keenness and zeal of its members, and the way the lodges were knit together by the secrecy of their union, and Masonic lodges made excellent recruiting grounds. So in 1777, Weishaupt joined a Masonic lodge and demanded every Illuminatus do likewise. Once initiated, they were to attain positions of leadership and turn the lodges into vehicles for Illuminati propaganda and expansion. Weishaupt also saw great value in literary societies and libraries, the internet of their day. He commanded his order to establish or infiltrate them so we may turn the public mind which way we will. At the same time, the Illuminati would monitor everything appearing in print. Weishaupt said, if a writer publishes anything that attracts notice, but does not accord with our plan, we must endeavor to win him over or decry him. Though utterly contemptuous of religion, Weishaupt placed a premium on recruiting clerics. The most wonderful thing of all, he wrote, is that the distinguished Lutheran and Calvinist theologians who belong to our order really believe that they see in it, the Illuminati, the true and genuine sense of Christian religion. O oh, mortal man, is there nothing you cannot be made to believe? Weishaupt didn't forget the common man. He said, we must win the common people in every corner. And he said, this will be obtained chiefly by means of the schools and by open, hearty behavior, condescension, popularity and toleration of their prejudices, which we shall at leisure root out and dispel. Nor did he ignore women, writing, There is no means of influencing men so powerfully as by means of women. Women should therefore be our chief study. We should insinuate ourselves into their good opinion, give them hints of emancipation. This, he argued, will cause them to work for us with zeal without knowing that they do so. Still, Weishaupt's perfect world would be a man's world. The head of every family will be the patriarch, the priest and the unlettered lord of his family. If this sounds like more deception and manipulation, you're right. Weishaupt wouldn't argue. The ultimate goal was to make men free and happy, but first they had to be made good, and that required manipulation, trickery, even coercion. While the Illuminati would be the enlightened aristocracy of the New World Order, even they weren't equal or free. A recruit or novice was under the complete control of his recruiter or insinuator. Novices were told what to read, how to think, and they kept a daily account of their every thought and action. They also compiled detailed personal histories. 
They had no secrets from their insinuator and obeyed every command without question. Initiates received a special name, usually something classical. Weishaupt's was Spartacus. Curiously, many picked names connected to ancient mystery cults like Osiris, Pythagoras, or Attis. Once a novice received initiation into the next rank, the Brethren of Minerva, he had truly entered the Illuminati. There were also two higher ranks, minor and major Illuminatus, but Weishaupt decreed that no religionist, that is, anyone retaining a scrap of their old belief, could be admitted to them. Nor was there any room for patriotism. Absolute loyalty to the order and one's Illuminati superiors was the rule. The love of one's prince and of one's country are incompatible with the ultimate aims of the order. Ordinary morality was also forbidden. Calumnies, poisonings, assassinations, perjury, treasons, and rebellions were not crimes if done on the command of superiors and for the good of the order. It's that old saying, to the pure, all things are pure. At root, it was antinomianism, the rejection of all traditional rules and restrictions. The Illuminati later instituted more higher grades, unknown to the rank and file. There were Scotch Knights, a nod to the Masonic Scottish Rite, Epops, Prefects, National Directors, National Prefects, and finally, the Grand Master, Adam Weishaupt himself. Illuminati propaganda insisted the order would free men from all religious prejudices, cultivate social virtues, and lead them to a speedy prospect of universal happiness in a state of liberty and moral equality, freed from subordination, rank, and riches. Weishaupt proclaimed, my explanation is accurate and complete. My means are effectual and irresistible. Our secret association works in a way nothing can withstand, and man shall soon be free and happy. If any of this sounds familiar, it should. Everything about Weishaupt's Illuminism echoes the style, substance, and promise of later communism. Coincidence or inheritance? So how did Weishaupt's plan work in practice? Researchers like Terry Melanson, who maintains the Conspiracy Archives, identifies about 450 confirmed Illuminati. Other estimates range from 600 to 2,000. Regardless, a huge increase from the original five. Still, secret societies always emphasize quality over quantity. Known Illuminati came almost exclusively from the 18th century intelligentsia. Lawyers, academics, physicians, writers, and theologians abound. Among them was Johann von Goethe, author of Faust and one of the most celebrated names in Western literature. And Goethe was confidential advisor to another Illuminatus, Duke Karl August of Saxe Weimar. The Illuminati roster includes an astounding number of barons and counts, as well as more important aristocrats, such as dukes and princes. Peasants, butchers, and chimney sweeps are absent. Jews, pagans, and ex-Jesuits were generally excluded, though exceptions were made. The great majority of Illuminati were Freemasons. Most were Germans. But there were brethren in Austria, Hungary, Switzerland, France, Denmark, and even Russia. There was an especially active cell in Naples, Italy. They played a guiding role in Naples' short-lived Parthenopian Republic in 1799. Weishaupt focused on recruiting what today we'd call influencers or opinion shapers. Illuminati brethren also mostly represented the have-sums of Enlightenment society, as opposed to the have-nots and the have-everythings. They have some, and they wanted more. They embodied both ambition and resentment. The same sort can be found in the driver's seat of almost every revolution. Marx, Lenin, and Castro would have felt quite at home. Despite the secrecy and conspiracy, Weishaupt's order seemed to evaporate under scrutiny. But evaporated water doesn't cease to exist. 
it just goes somewhere else. Under pressure from the church, Carl Theodore of Bavaria banned the Illuminati in 1784, and again in 1785, yet again in 1787, and again in 1790. Obviously, suppression wasn't easy, nor thorough. Outside Bavaria, the order was mostly unscathed. Weishaupt slipped away to nearby Gotha, and he was protected by its Illuminatus prince, Haver von Zwack. One of Weishaupt's most key lieutenants was briefly jailed but escaped to Paris in 1786. A year later, so did Johann Bode, whom Weishaupt made executive secretary of the order. The exposure of the Illuminati was at least partly the work of a disaffected brother, Baron Adolf von Kinige, who objected to Weishaupt's stiff-necked and authoritarian leadership. Von Kinige was also one who accused Weishaupt of secret Jesuitry. Earlier, I said that there were other Illuminati cults. While the term goes back to the mystery cults of the Roman Empire, Illuminism wasn't just a Western concept. In the 1500s, in what's now Afghanistan, a brotherhood appeared, the Roshaniya, or Illuminated Ones. They had elaborate, very secret, initiatory rituals. Their founder and illuminated master was a Sufi warrior mystic named Pir Bayezid Khan. He decried the tyranny and spiritual imperfections of secular rulers, including the powerful Mughal emperor. Pir Bayezid preached the overthrow of the existing order and the creation of a new world order based on an egalitarian, communistic society. Men and women would enjoy a paradise of perfect equality under the benign guidance of an enlightened elite. Sounds familiar, yes? Was the Roshaniya just part of what author Manley Hall called the larger movement? Around the same time, in Spain, there were the Alumbrados, or Illuminados. They were first mentioned in 1492 and were supposed to have come to Spain from Italy. Church officials suspected them of being a survival of the earlier Cathars. Supporting the notion was the Alumbrados' rejection of the Catholic Church's authority and sacraments. Following masters guided by visions of angels and saints, these Spanish Illuminati sought mystical knowledge and ecstatic union with God. Once that was attained, you could indulge lusts and other desires all you wanted without actually sinning. To the pure, all things are pure, yet again. This led to claims that the whole thing was a cover for a sex cult. The Inquisition intervened, and the Alumbrados were banned in 1525. Among those implicated in the cult was none other than the future founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius Loyola. Still, the Alumbrados survived and spread to France in the early 1600s. There they were called the Illuminés. Under the leadership of a former Catholic curate, Pierre Guerin, these Illuminati attained a following in Picardy before being suppressed, but not destroyed, in 1635. And their appearance has an interesting overlap with another secret order, the Rosicrucians. In the early 1700s, yet another bunch of Illuminés appeared in the remote Sevens region of southern France. They were part of a Protestant revolt against the French crown and the Catholic Church. Some of these Illuminati fled to England. There, they formed a sect called the French Prophets who joined or infiltrated esoteric Masonic lodges. In 1754, back in France, an occultist named Joachim Martin de Pasquale founded yet another Illuminist sect dubbed the Order of Knights, Masons, Elect Priests of the Universe. Their doctrine was drawn from ancient Jewish mystical traditions, the Kabbalah, ritual magic, and even the doctrine of Swedish mystic Emanuel Swedenborg. They spread all the way to Russia, where a cell thrived in Moscow until suppressed by Catherine the Great in the 1790s. 
As a fixture of popular culture, the Illuminati tale kept evolving. One of the first places it might appear is Mary Shelley's 1818 novel, Frankenstein. Weishaupt's hometown of Ingolstadt is the same place Victor Frankenstein makes his monster. Some see Shelley's tale as an allegory for Adam Weishaupt's creation of the Illuminati, a monster over which he lost control. Certainly, Mary's husband, poet Percy Shelley, was fascinated by the Illuminati. Researcher Scott DeHart argues that Percy Shelley was himself an Illuminatus and the real author of the novel. Weishaupt's secret society went on to become a stock villain in Gothic potboilers. Jane Austen mentions them half-jokingly in Northanger Abbey. They also come up in Tolstoy's War and Peace and have been referenced by contemporary novelists Umberto Eco, Dan Brown, and the Marvel Universe of comic book fame. And then there are the video games and music. Madonna's 2015 song, Illuminati, just continues the refrain. The Illuminati have spawned endless conspiracy theories as well. Nesta Webster, in her 1924 book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements, resurrected claims of Illuminati influence behind the French Revolution and further linked them to the Bolsheviks and pretty much every other radical movement since the beginning of time. Illuminati has become the blanket term for any shadowy elite bent on global domination. What do Henry Kissinger, Queen Elizabeth, David Rockefeller, and arms magnate Basil Zaharoff have in common? They're all accused of being Illuminati. In the 1990s, British conspiracist David Icke went further, way further, by turning the Illuminati into shape-shifting lizard people from outer space. What would Adam Weishaupt make of all this? Would he be disgusted that his plan for making men happy and free had been co-opted, corrupted, and lampooned? Or would he find satisfaction that the name has survived and that his secret society may have achieved power and influence beyond anything he could have imagined in 1776?